Okay, let's go to our next slide, please. So this slide is where were we a few years ago? We, we've done a number of studies. In fact, I've lost count yet, but we've done a number of studies that we have, where we looked at the software development lifecycle from a security perspective, and we basically found some very troubling results. So, for example, we found in our research, again, this goes back a couple of years, that uh, there's no defined software development process for many organizations. Policies, requirements, and standards are often ad hoc or not integrated into the SDLC. Probably not too surprising to folks on the audience on the call who basically are in application, application security. Another area of lack uh, lacking uh, would be lack of formal AppSec training programs. Obviously, you need to train people. If you talk about security, that's one thing, but you have to know how to do it. And training becomes really important in that regard. And then a very surprising result to me, Ed, was that half of our respondents in our study are not testing for application security at all. And two-thirds of mobile apps weren't being tested at all. And that's, I think, the source of a lot of uh, <laughs> you know, pains in the chest, if you will, in the area of mobile application security. As a company, as a research company, we've done a number of studies in that area. Um, let's go to our next slide. So organizations don't have a defined SDLC. SDLC is still lacking. Tools aren't integrated into the SDLC. I mentioned that before. Security automation often uh, used after deployment. In other words, you actually start to do it, but you do it too late in the process. And then policies and standards are still rarely used or observed. I mean, people know about them, but they don't necessarily comply with them. We'll talk a little bit about that more uh, later in the presentation. And again, I have to talk about my competitors here as a, as a research company, but Mars does some great work. And they basically said organizations implementing an SCLC show better ROI than the overall population, which is, again, a very a nice fact that if you basically are using the SCLC, you're going to be more successful in terms of ROI. And an averaging group said adopting a formal SCLC process increases security and reduces uh, severity and cost of vulnerability incidents while generating a 4x return on investment and other application security approaches. So um, that's pretty good stuff. And it's, they're very strong indicators of the value proposition of embedding security fundamentally into the SDLC. The next slide, please. So building in security, you know, even though we talk about it, how important it is, we know that it's not being done very well. The Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, and regardless of which statistic is used, there is a substantial cost savings for fixing security flaws during requirements gathering then deployment. Now you look at the NIST graph and also the IBM uh, System Sciences Institute graph, you see the pattern here. And in terms of cost, costs go up, vulnerabilities or inability to deal with vulnerabilities go up uh, as, as you basically implement security later in the process. So, for example, if you're waiting to the production phase, you're waiting, it's too late. And obviously, where, where you want to conserve and maintain costs is build it into your requirements and architecture, kind of that early stage. In privacy, we have this concept called privacy by design, where at the design phase of a process that uses information about people and household, it's early in that process. That's where you get the greatest bang for your buck. And that's really what we see here, not only in terms of the NIST graph or the IBM graph, but other studies in Poneman Institute studies, not to plug it, um, we've basically found that the same phenomenon. So we'll look at our next slide, Ed. Most organizations actually don't understand AppSec risk. And we think that's important. Well, that's probably why we're not getting a lot of this, the share of resources that we need to have in order to ensure that applications are properly secured and risk is managed properly as well. So it looks like hackers are going after easy pickings, and that is application. 90% of vulnerabilities are in applications, not in the network layer, even though the network layer receives line funds of sharing and security. 92% of attacks are not difficult and exploit known vulnerabilities. So again, the hackers, they look at applications as a source of opportunity. Applications are often not risk ranked. Um, so how do you know which to test? How, how deep do you need to test and so forth? 
web application firewalls, application whitelisting, and runtime application self-protection, RASP, are now widely adopted and often, often misconfigured. Organizations focus on vulnerabilities, not risk, which is a big problem. The, uh, the focus should be on risk because not all vulnerabilities are equal. And then mature organizations are aware of effectiveness. Uh, uh, mature organizations are aware of effectiveness of standards, but many organizations are not at that level of maturity. So they don't really understand the purpose and value of doing audits or understanding threats against the organization or, or know how to improve security architecture and coding practices, which is all a very big problem. That's kind and of Larry, oh, yeah. uh, and Larry this, is, this is Ed. Just you know, a quick comment on, on this. You know, one thing that I've heard from you over the years is uh, whenever folks identify maturity uh, problems with respect to application security, their tendency is really to just throw tools and technology at the problem. However, right. in the research, right. the research that you've done, it's, it's been shown very clearly, uh, you know, not only from, from the Panama Institute but others, that it's the people and process investments that get the biggest return on investment, uh, yet folks still want to just throw tools and technology at the problem. Exactly. You know, so, you know, the, when I think about good security, I think about really three elements. There's the people element, there's a the technology element, and then there's something which is vague called the government, the governance element, you know, having the right organizational structure in place. And it's really an area that, again, you talk to people who are not knowledgeable, this is not their area of expertise, and they think that if you throw money at it and get the right technology, you solve the problem. And that is probably not the case. That's a very important exactly. point. Glad you reminded me. And speaking about great research, Ed, here's a, uh, some of the results of a study that we did. But let's first talk about uh, Cisco. Cisco report it, report indicated that the top product categories exploited were applications, 32.6 percent, and infrastructure at 41.9 percent. Pretty high percentages. And then if you kind of look at the graph here. This is an interesting graph where we looked at two groups, developers, application developers, and we looked at security practitioners. And what we wanted to understand is whether they were seeing these issues in similar ways or they, they might be dissimilar. If you look at the blue bar, the blue bar in every case is longer than the red bar, which means something's going on here. So let me tell you how to read this graph. Application security is a top priority in my organization. 58% strongly agree or agree with that statement. And that's so that basically that's what security people believe. Developers, on the other hand, it goes down to 38%, a 20-point spread. Now, if you're a statistician and you're listening, what does that mean? 20 points is it statistically significant? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Probably in in this study, I forget what the margin of error was, but it was something less than 4%, like 3.8%. So anything greater than that is a statistically significant result. And if you kind of eyeball the list, it's pretty clear that there is a gap between the security folks who are supposed to secure application and the developers who basically are in the front line making their, you know, attempting to meet objectives like get their product done in a reasonable period of time. So application security is clearly not a top priority for developers. Security technologies are adequate in protecting our information assets and IT infrastructure. 54% of our uh, security folks believe that to be true, and only 44% of our developers. And the list goes on and on. I don't want to bore you with all the details, but you can see in every case, every single case, the developers are below the security folks. The only place where it's close is on the very last item. There are ample resources to ensure all IT security requirements are accomplished. And here, the security people agree with the developers that that's not true. That we ample is probably the wrong word. We're not quite there in an ample resource sense. Okay. Let's yeah, and then Larry, one one thing that always uh, struck me about this particular uh, research is, and normally security folks are the more pessimistic, uh, arguably the most pessimistic in, in any organization. Yes. Yet here, the the developers who are the ones who are actually writing the code are clearly saying that security is not, you know, a top priority in their in their organization. You know, that that first set of bars just scares the crap out of me. I, I'm no statistician, but I'm status I'm stat statistically frightened by the fact that nearly two thirds of developers don't view security as a top priority in their organization. Yeah, that pressure to release, you see that, you know, where people are told that you have to get this application completed and we'll, we'll worry about the security issues later in the process. 
And I think that's driving a lot of people to say, you know, this is not necessarily a, a high priority, and it should be. Now here are the, some other data points from our study, Ed. Um, basically, we looked at folks at different organizational levels, executives, directors, managers, supervisors, technicians, and staff. And so we asked the question, for example, about the existence of defined secure, defined secure architecture standards used in the organization. And 75% of our executives believe that their organizations had it and were doing it, as compared to only 23% of our tech. So again, these are the same organizations approximately. You have to wonder why are there why is there such a gap? Similarly, on the second graph, little bar chart, your organization keeps training programs up to date for development teams. If you're an executive, most of you, 71 percent up sure we're doing that, we're keeping it up to date. Talk to the tech folk and 19 percent believe that to be the case. And we found other results that were very similar, but it's very interesting that just the position level of the respondent influences their perception about whether they're doing a reasonably good job on application security or not. Any comments on this on this slide, Ed? Again, just uh, you know, disturbing at how dramatic a drop is from you know, the executive and director level all the way down to the to the technician that, that's actually you know doing the work in the field. Uh, you know that, that this disparity is just is uh, remarkable. It really is. And you know, when we debrief some of these respondents, the tech people, they really know a lot more, or at least they say they know a lot more than what executives know. You know, when you get to the CISO level, you're relying on a lot of people who report to you, you know, in the chain of command. And a lot of information may not get into your hands, which you might need to really help the company. So this gap Absolutely. is indicative of a big problem. Okay, let's get to our next slide. So Obviously, aligning management and staff, you know, what's the implication? Developers don't always understand InfoSec and security policies, so I think that's pretty clear. Developers are not necessarily trained in security. I mean, maybe in college, you know, where they got their degree in, say, computer science, they had a course on, or a day. <laughs> it shouldn't be, it would be a course, a day or a couple of days de dedicated to security. Policies may be in place, but they lack informant, enforcement. And, and this renders the value of that policy to be virtually un unimportant or invisible. So policies are in place, but we need to do more than just have something that's on paper. It needs to actually change behavior. Management, security, engineers speak languages, different languages, basically the Tower of Babel. So, you know, when you say things like confidential data must be protected. Protected from what? How do I protect it? Architecture guidance, coding standards, remediation specifics, once vulnerabilities are found. So when you have these terms, this language, it becomes very difficult for management that are not familiar with security issues to fully understand the problem simply because they, they communicate, there's a communication problem. And we see that not only here, but in other areas of IT security as well. Let's go, ahead and go to our next slide. <coughs> Now, this is a big one, and I think, Ed, you're going to comment on this because you're an expert in AppSec training. But basically, we find that a lot of organizations are not doing anything in the training department, or they'll call it training like on-the-job experience, but it's not real training. People need to know how to do this, you know, because a lot of the application developers, as like I said before, are not getting this at the college or university level. You need to do it. And, and even if they did, by the time you enter the workforce, you probably forgot 75% of it. Okay, Kahneman Research, I know something about that. 19% of developers believe that their organizations keep training programs up to date for development teams. That, in the math, means that 1 minus 19%, which is 81%, if my math is correct, do not believe that to be true. That is very troubling. Mature organizations have application security training programs in place for the developers, and these programs focus on specific role-based responsibilities, offensive and defensive tactics, application security policies, areas of vulnerability, best practices and standards to be followed, various platforms and languages that are developing in and on. So again, the organizations that meet this kind of high level of maturity in the SDLC are basically building training programs that deal with these bulleted points. Forrester, once again, said, effective developer education programs can reduce vulnerabilities by approximately 25%. That is a pretty impressive number, and I think and our research supports that as well. And very absolutely, 
you know, Veracode said 30% the fix rate improvement compared to those that don't have an e-learning program. So if people have had e-learning and they've been through the program, their ability to fix problems is substantially higher than those who did not. Again, these are little tidbits that show the value proposition to having a good training program in place. Let's go to our next slide. I love this. Robert Half IT Security Survey, 85% of U.S. tech executives are taking steps to increase IT security in 2015, which just ended. So I still think we can go back and do an audit of that 85%, but it does seem like a pretty high percentage, but not too surprising. And of that group of improvement, 54% said they're going to enhance employee training on IT security issues. And that sounds pretty good, but keep in mind that the training may focus, is, focus on other areas of security, not necessarily application security. But I assume because more and more companies recognize the, the risk and the, the sheer risk of application security relative to other areas, that they would be enhanced training on the application security side. Okay, next slide. So now, Ed, I'm going to talk about emerging challenges, again, but feel, please feel free to chime in. So implications for application security. Internet of Things is dependent on software. Software engineers are not trained or confident regarding security. And obviously, the IoT changes the world as we know it from a security perspective and a privacy perspective. And Ed, you're an expert at that. You kind of know from the automotive industry just how big a problem this really is. Oh, absolutely, Larry. You're, you're right. I mean, software is running our world these days, and we've got 81% of software engineers you know, that don't feel that they're adequately trained, and uh, it's just a, it's a looming uh, problem for, for the industry yeah. as a whole. I was uh, talking to a, 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 a CISO yesterday. We were talking about IoT, and he basically looked at it as kind of chains, and the weak link is, is could be anywhere. And if you basically have one of the connected devices that's insecure, that has an application security vulnerability, you you can bring down all of the other dependent parts to that. Uh, yeah, and, that and what, what's amazing though is is how many different things that software is finding its, its way into. We had even one of our security engineers recently, um, he, he bought a, a, a refrigerator that had you know, a display panel on it that you know, his 10-year-old son can go check the weather every day on his refrigerator. And his refrigerator ended up getting attacked and owned. It was being used to send out you know, spam as a mail server. And he was fortunate enough to detect it and shut it down, but it's just amazing that now your refrigerator can get, can get taken over and used as a spam engine. Nuts. Yeah. Well, that, that another conversation I had was specifically that devices like your refrigerator, believe it or not, can become part of a botnet. <laughs> I, I heard that. I said, so my denial of service is occurring because my refrigerator is now connected. So really, it's a, it definitely is an issue where all of these devices, which we don't think of them as like computing computers, but they are fully fledged compute computers. And they're subject to all of these vulnerabilities without any of the control mechanisms in place. IDC, by 2018, fully 75% of chief security officers and chief information security officers will report directly to the CEO, not the CIO. That's kind of an interesting issue because one theory is that if you move the CISO to a higher level in the organization, they will have better command over security issues. And that will, in fact, help the organization achieve its security goals. Um, the idea is reporting to the CIO is also a conflict at times because the CIO is about making IT more effective over on a lot of different variables, not just security. So it's an interesting issue. I'm not sure this going to be 75%, though. But we'll see. It's only two years away. The execs and practitioners are still out of alignment. 70% of executives are think their AppSec program is mature or very mature compared to 20% of practitioners? That's another one of those gap questions. So the people who are in the trenches, they know whether it's mature or not, but the people who are executives say, oh, it's been around here for ages. And they assume because it's been around there for a long time, it's, it's, it's mature, and it may not be mature at all. It may be very immature. Another factor that has implications to application security, the rise of the nation state attack. Bad guys are now working with the, the love <laughs> of their government, uh, and they're very well funded and very persistent. 
and they're looking for kind of the low-hanging fruit, which could be applications that are insecure. 74% of organizations rate their ability to recognize a state nation state attack as poor or very poor, yet 81% are concerned or very concerned, which is weird. So they basically recognize that, it's, that they're not ready for it, but they don't necessarily show the right level of concern, or they are showing a very high level of concern. 75% say their organizations lack expertise in the tech to prevent a nation state attack, and this points to a substantial lack of effective technology. And the proverbial missiles and bombs being used are software. That's where it's happening. Of course, another bullet that has implications to application security, the good old regulatory issue. It's, there are more regulations and legal issues that can impact an organization in a very serious way. Okay, let's go to our next slide. I will. And Larry, just one quick plug uh, for some Ponemon okay. Institute research. Uh, you know, the rise of the nation state attack, uh, which is posted at ponemon.org under um, under your research tab. I think it's a great report, uh, and it's uh, it's very recent as well. So I just wanted to give a quick plug on that uh, and make make sure folks know that it is some some research that's available that you've that you've recently conducted. Thank you very much, and I appreciate that plug. And anyone who's interested in reading it, please just contact Poneman Institute, and we'll share with you. And I'd love to hear from you on it. So thank you, Ed. So the other issue too about threats. You know, threats are not all constant. They vary for different platforms, technologies, and languages, and, and even more. Um, we know that web embedded mobile attacks in different ways. Um, you cannot implement effective design and coding countermeasures without knowing these specific attacks. Adobe Flash, for example, floated, um, you know, we know that that's an area of great risk. PHP is widely known as being insecure. Java frameworks littered with security flaws. Not to pick on Java, but it's a source of engine up. It's not, not good. Um, applications written in web scripting languages have a higher prevalence of SQL injection and cross-site scripting than applications written in .NET or Java. Each technology has different security features and vulnerabilities. .NET or a Java EE protect against buffer overflows, but Object C does not. Uh, Heartbleed, Shellshock, Poodle, GoToFail, and Stuxnet are all examples of software-born exploits. So again, the threat platform, understanding that is very important, and building your software so it's resilient. It doesn't necessarily have to deal with these issues because you're closing up the vulnerability, shoring it up, as we used to say in the Navy. Let's go to our next slide. Now, mobile application security is an area that we studied as well as a research company, and it's an area of, I think, great risk to organizations, if they, especially if they don't know what they're doing and they don't apply the right resources to it. So in 2013, 65% of developers said their organizations do not test mobile applications. Same question asked two years later, 33% of companies are still not testing their applications. So if there's some improvement, but 33% is basically a very significant percentage of organizations that are taking this huge risk. Another, I thought, cool finding was that $34 million on average was spent on mobile app development by Fortune larger companies, mostly Fortune 500 size companies, but only 5% of that was allocated to securing mobile apps. And half, half of the companies that were developing mobile apps, 50%, said they, devote, they de devoted a zero-dollar budget, in other words, no budget, zero, to mobile application security. So again, that's another depressing sign that if it's important and you're really concerned about security, you basically have a budget to securing these things. Gardner, uh, another company that we work with and compete against at times, claimed in 2014 that more than 75% of mobile app applications fulfill basic security tests through 2015. And I think they got it right. I think they are absolutely right. And then Veracode, mobile applications have the highest rate of cryptographic issues, and that's 87% at for Android and 80% for iOS. Only 80% at 87%, which is a huge percentage. Developers don't understand how to properly implement crypto for the various mobile platforms they're developing for. So, you know, obviously that's another source of anxiety. Next slide. Now these, this, this graph, there's a lot here, so I'm not going to do it 
detail discussion of it, but it's a very interesting graph because this is information security pain point. So and the, and the title is why are 90% of attacks still at the application level? And we basically see in terms of pain points, applications security is only rated at 5%, which is inconsistent with the, the reality, which is that it's a very, very significant area of risk and vulnerability. More than 80% of IT security spending continues to be at the network layer, primarily focused on perimeter controls. And we, we studied that as well. It's getting a little bit better, but it's a slow moving train. And more resources are being allocated to application security, but it's still overwhelmingly on the network layers. Next slide. We believe, I believe that uh, things are gonna get worse before they get better, but they will get better. Uh, and applications will continue to be targets. And you know, Ed, I think there's something on your screen. Oh, thank you. Department of Homeland Security, 90% of security incidents res result from exploits against the defects in software. Tim Clark, head of brand journalism for SAP in a recent Forbes blog said, many organizations have significant network security in place but it's not enough as 84% of all cyber attacks are happening at the application layer. None of that 80% or 87%, 84%, it's all in the same ballpark. Cisco's 2015 annual security report, they claim in their report, and it's a good report, I have it right here on my desk, intruders are increasingly targeting the application stack for exploitation, not a surprise. Rise of cloud app and the ubiquity of do-it-yourself open source content management systems and CMS has have created vulnerable websites and, and software as a service offerings. And an underlying system slash network layer may, be, may withstand malicious attacks, but application level components built by developers are often riddled with vulnerability. That's because the developers don't know how to do it right. They have not had that training. That's a big part of it. CNET, programs, programmers are copying secure security flaws in their software. In other words, they take it from place to place, from system to system. Programs, programmers don't write all of their code. They routinely borrow code from others and they're not checking the code for security flaws. And that has been going on for ages. Wall Street, most developers have not been trained on secure coding practices. Very depressing news if the application issue will continue into the near future. But again, I think it's gonna get better because there are now solutions that didn't exist before that I think could really improve the state of the world. Now, Ed, if you could help me with this graph, it's, uh, that'd be much appreciated. This looks like financial services and retail under attack. Yeah, exactly right. Um, so it was you know, the distribution of attacks um, by, uh, by type. So for example, uh, SQL injection, um, you know, very prevalent in retail uh, and in others, uh, as well as finance. But then, uh, as you see some of the other attacks, you know, they, they kind of drop off on the finance side. I mean, cross-site scripting comes back, uh, straight HTTP uh, requests, which couldn't include phishing attacks, uh, highly prevalent in, uh, in retail. That's all that, that this graph is, uh, is saying, is that there's, um, whether it's retail or finance or other industries, there's a whole bunch of different attack vectors, and it just shows you uh, in certain industries, uh, some attacks are, are highly targeted, like the HTTP phishing attacks, uh, a lot of that going on in retail, whereas, you know, a lot of SQL injection and finance, because they're typically trying to get to, um, you know, databases that have financial information uh, and, and other, other types of uh, financial records. And I also want to apologize. I just learned that my audio may have not been working very well as, as I was giving my big spiel. So to the audience, I apologize for what happened. Yeah, I've, I've been hearing you just fine, Larry, so uh, hopefully this oh, comes great. out fine on the recording as well. Oh, great, because I, I got a note, one of those notes. Larry, speak up, we can't hear you. <laughs> Get our next slide, thank you for your help. Okay, industry regulation, this is my last slide, but this is the New York Department of Financial Services. Um, they conducted risk assessments and found more needs to be done to secure financial system. And, and uh, this is their proposed mandate. Implement and maintain written cybersecurity policy, which is good for not just this organization, but every organization should have it. Designate a CISO or someone with an equivalent title and submit annual reports assessing cybersecurity to your the leadership or board of directors in some cases. 
application security, maintain and implement written procedures, guidelines, and standards reasonably designed to ensure the security of applications utilized by the entity. Again, that's part of the proposed mandate. Mandatory training to cybersecurity personnel and require key personnel to stay abreast of changing threats and countermeasures, and then conduct annual pen testing and quarterly vulnerability assessments. So New York Department of Financial Services hats off to you for being smart. All of these recommendations are steps that organizations should consider doing, not just those that are in government. This would apply to just about any organization, even small and mom and pop companies. The bottom line. Yeah, and, 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 I'm sorry, Larry. All I was going to say is, you know, what uh, we're seeing this in the automotive industry uh, these days as well, uh, and in the U.S. at least, it's, it's starting to be regulated by, or at least initiated uh, by some of the lawmakers. Uh, for example, uh, Senator Markey of Massachusetts introduced an act of the security and privacy in your car, uh, which uh, he and, and Senator Blumenthal, uh, they named it the SPY Act, which I think is just a terrible name for something talking about security and privacy in your car, but that's beside the point. Uh, and one of the things that the SPY Act is calling for is you know, sort of like a, a, a sticker. Uh, you know, when you go to buy a, a new car and there's a sticker on the window that tells you how many miles per gallon and things like that, one of the elements of the SPY Act is a similar type of sticker on your automobile uh, for attestation from the from the automotive manufacturer with respect to the cybersecurity due diligence that they've conducted, uh, which I think is terrific. I think it's a great idea. Super. Thank you very much, Ed. In fact, I think our next slide is a great slide because I'm going to turn it over. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fair enough. Larry, thank you so much, and please do thank you. chime in on, on my slides as well as uh, as we're rolling forward here. I'm planning on it. Thank you, sir. All righty. So the uh, second half of our presentation is going to talk about uh, threat modeling, risk ranking, and then optimizing your software development lifecycle. Uh, Larry, uh, as, as usual, has done a phenomenal job highlighting uh, research that, that he has led in the industry. Uh, and also graciously refer to others uh, that have conducted research in the industry. And I, I think it really sets the stage very well uh, to try to uh, help you understand now what can you do, uh, what are some steps that you can take that will give you uh, some decent leverage to try to improve on those people and process areas uh, that we were talking about earlier. And I'm going to start with, uh, with threat modeling. But before I do, I'm just going to throw up this a uh, bit of an eye chart here. This is really just a nomenclature normalization, uh, just so folks can you know, understand that you know vulnerability, a vulnerability is different than a threat, uh, different than risk. Uh, and I'll be using these terms in in the coming uh, slides. Uh, this is really just kind of a little a reference guide. So uh, as I'm using words like exploit and risk and countermeasure, uh, this is a this is precisely what I'm what I'm talking about. <clears throat> So first and foremost, you heard Dr. Poneman talking about uh, taking a risk-based approach to application security, and this can very much start on the security assessment side. And when I say assessment, I mean uh, essentially some kind of, of a test of the application, whether it's you know, an automated vulnerability scan, a manual penetration test, or even just a paper audit with respect to the security due diligence that the team has taken. Uh, conventional approaches are not secure, are not risk-based. Uh, in fact, what they often are doing is just using an automated vulnerability scanner uh, to look for some type of uh, you know, common um, pattern that might be a vulnerability. Uh, more importantly, there's very little guidance that's provided to the software developers on how to fix the defect, otherwise known as defect remediation. And frankly, finding security problems or potential problems is the easy part. Fixing them is the tough part. And as you can see from the State of Application Security Maturity Research Institute uh, done by the Panama Institute, the majority of application security programs are focusing on uh, things other than uh, securing the software development lifecycle. 70% are not focused on that. Uh, and even automating security testing during development, you've still got less than 50% of survey responders that are saying that they're doing that. I want to talk about threat modeling just for a moment. 
threat modeling is something that we do in our personal lives every single day. We just don't realize it. We don't think about, uh, oh, I'm going to threat model now. But even the house that we live in, uh, do you have a lock on your front door? Yes. Well, why do you have a lock on your front door? Oh, because there might be an intruder that will try to get in. Oh, do you have an alarm system in your house? If you do, is your alarm system just on the windows and doors on the first floor, or do you also have them on the second floor? Most folks just have them on the first floor. Why? It's not because the threat is any different. The threat is still an intruder coming in here, but it's much more difficult to realize that threat on the second floor because the intruder will need a ladder, or will be much more visible, etc. And that's really the difference between um, a threat and a, um, and a, a vulnerability. Um, so threat modeling, it provides more leverage than any other security activity. And I'll talk about this on the next slide because what it's doing is it, every single function in the software development lifecycle, once you go through an, an exercise of threat modeling, it will help guide them into either the design or the coding or the testing or the requirements uh, management that is their job responsibility. So it makes every engineering activity more impactful. And threat modeling is very simple, very straightforward. Uh, you can do it on a, on a whiteboard. Microsoft built a, um, a card game called Escalation of Privilege that you can download from their website, or you can just have a live conversation about it. The whole concept is first you identify the assets you're looking to protect, and then talk through or, or uh, model or diagram out what some potential threats are to those assets, how they might be realized, and more importantly, how you defend against them. Just like you lock your door when you leave your house or set the alarm, that's what folks need to start doing with respect to application security. And here's some examples of how threat modeling can be leveraged across multiple roles in a software development and IT team. So for architects, it will help them understand and prioritize how to protect the assets. And it might make them um, choose different uh, different options. For example, if you have an application that's already in use and for authentication it just requires a username and password, uh, that might be easily spoofed or you know, subject to some type of, um, uh, of attack. Uh, the architect might choose to use two-factor authentication to make that authentication hurdle a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. But if they don't understand the potential risks, associated with a simple username and password combination for authentication, they'll never be able to get to the step of trying to understand how that could be exploited and what countermeasures to put in place. Uh, similar to, uh, to software testers, once you have a threat model, you have by default the outline of a good security testing plan because the testers can just verify all of these threats that you've identified, can they be successful? Can I test for them? Are there countermeasures in place? Uh, and similarly for, for IT and DevOps, you can even do a deployment review uh, against the threat model to determine whether or not you've got appropriate countermeasures in place uh, for things like SQL injection. You might have a SQL injection vulnerability in your code itself, but in the as deployed state, you may put a web application firewall in front of that application that will uh, trap SQL injection uh, attacks and vulnerabilities so that threat can be mitigated. But threat modeling really helps enable every one of those teams and every one of those roles. Next I want to talk a little bit about application risk rate, rating. And risk rating, this is really just a, a prioritization exercise to help you understand which applications to test and how deeply to test them. Most of the clients that we work with have dozens and some have hundreds of, of software applications that are running their business. And they need an appropriate balance of depth and frequency and, and cost when trying to figure out how to test those applications with respect to security. Creating a risk rating framework is a wonderful way to prioritize real risk to the business that is coming through the software applications that are running your business. And I'm going to talk through a few examples and a framework of uh, risk rating uh, in just the next couple of slides. Uh, but this, the last bullet on here, uh, which talks about understanding risk-based options, sometimes 
you might be perfectly acceptable, uh, it might be acceptable to you to move forward with a software application that has a vulnerability because it's a low risk application, doesn't touch sensitive data, and it's going to have a short lifespan. So you, you might not want to do security testing on it at all, but if you make that choice, you should do so in an informed manner after you've put it through an appropriate risk rating or, uh, process because we see too many applications that get over-tested and too many applications that get under-tested, and that's what risk rating is really all about. <clears throat> now keep in mind, you know, there's no standard formula here because risk is contextual to your organization. And risk with respect to application security is a simple multiplication of the likelihood of an attack and the impact of that attack uh, being successful. And again, this comes right back to, uh, to threat modeling. Um, and keep in mind, threats don't have to necessarily be in software code to affect a software application. It can be inherited from other dependencies or other systems that the application is connected to. Software applications do not live in isolation, that's for sure. So here's a simple table where I've just chosen uh, four criteria to start. Uh, does the, uh, what type of sensitive data does the application have? Uh, what is the lifespan of the application? Uh, are there regulatory compliance uh, mandates on it? And is it customer facing? And then for each one of these, uh, I've chose to uh, assign a score of 0 to 3, which gives me you know, a scale of 0 to 12 for each of those four categories. And then you just draw a threshold. Uh, so in this example here, a uh, tier three low critical application is one that's going to score from zero to three. Tier two is an application scoring four to eight, and then uh, anything that scores higher than nine or nine or higher is a tier one mission critical application. So for example, if the application has you know, highly sensitive data, a long lifespan, uh, multiple compliance requirements from either legal or customers or regulators, and it's a public facing application, all of those are, are most likely going to be scored two or three on my, on my criticality rating, and that's going to push that application with a score of nine or higher and make it a tier one application. You know, a low risk application might be you know, a marketing website that is only up for 30 days because it's a cashback website. Uh, you know, if you buy, um, you know, you buy lipstick and you fill out this form, we'll send you $2 back in the mail. Uh, it doesn't really handle any sensitive data, isn't connected to other critical applications, et cetera. Uh, that could be a very low risk application. The next step is to calibrate the frequency and depth of testing according to the risk rating. So for mission critical applications, you might want to have a, a source code analysis for every major code change. And you might want to do um, a manual penetration test you know, once a year or once every uh, four, four months or something like that. Similarly for tier two and for tier three. This is what's going to get you that balance of cost and, uh, and value. Obviously, you want to spend more time uh, and go a little bit deeper on the mission critical applications, the tier one applications. And for the tier three applications, this is where you could probably leverage a lot of that uh, automation that, that you may have bought into, whether it's you know, your bought app scan for, for web vulnerability scanning or uh, you've got HP Fortify for, for source code review. Um, that's where uh, something like a, an automated uh, scan can help uh, and do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Once you've gone through your application risk rating exercise and calibrated your testing depth and frequency uh, for each application rating, next is the remediation prioritization, uh, determining what to fix. And this, again, brings you right back into that threat modeling. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago is there a compensating control that is put in place if you find a vulnerability, such as a SQL injection vulnerability that is mitigated by a web application firewall? Uh, if so, you can, uh, you can lower the priority of that SQL injection vulnerability that was found because it's not urgent to fix it. You have a mitigating control in place. Other factors uh, might increase the importance. And again, it, it really is related to um, your risk appetite and the disaster recovery uh, plans that you've put in place. Uh, and for mission critical applications, by the way, you definitely should have a disaster recovery plan because if, that, if those applications either come offline or become compromised, uh, you need a plan on what to do. 
speaking of a plan of what to do, a fine segue into our next sector, our uh, next segment of the agenda, which is optimizing your software development lifecycle. This chart here is uh, an overlay of security activities on the right-hand side in the green box compared with a, a typical uh, functional uh, software development lifecycle. Um, it doesn't matter what software uh, development process you use, whether it's uh, water in, which is what is displayed here, uh, extreme programming, agile, rational unified process, at every, at, at every um, uh, software development lifecycle, you have to at, at some point have some kind of uh, design, some kind of requirements, some kind of coding, some kind of testing. And uh, adding some, a security layer on top of that is what I've done here on the right-hand side. Now, sequencing which to introduce at which point in time is definitely going to be important. And again, it's contextual for your organization. We've seen organizations start with security testing and kind of work backward into security code reviews and then threat modeling and definition of security objectives. Conversely, we've seen organizations start with security objectives and sort of force that into architecture and design uh, requirements, uh, coding practices, and security test activities. And for each one of these activities, whether it's threat modeling at the architecture phase, phase code review, the programming phase, uh, penetration testing, uh, using vulnerability scanners, they, they yield different results and different values. Uh, you know, the, the automated scanners, we use them in our, in our uh, line of work all the time, but we understand what their limitations are. They're prone to false positives. They can't detect uh, complex vulnerabilities. That's what we use humans for, as opposed to, to robots. Uh, and code review uh, is very important. Uh, in fact, you know, you f if you find a single security vulnerability during a code review and fix it, you can stop a potential propagation problem. Um, because if you use, if, if you reuse components such as an authentication library or um, an authorization uh, routine. If you reuse that and it's got a vulnerability in it, it's just propagating throughout your entire uh, application every time it's used. Now, when we conduct a software development um, lifecycle uh, gap analysis, this is the, the rough process that we use. Um, we'll start by understanding the team roles and structure. Uh, and, and right after that, we try to understand what are the regulatory requirements, legal requirements, customer requirements, uh, and security policies that you're asking your team to adhere to. And then we compare that uh, against uh, a best practices filter and generate uh, a gap analysis report with recommendations. Now, you can conduct this yourself. Uh, in fact, uh, the research that uh, Dr. Poneman led uh, with respect to application security a couple of years ago basically took a set of questions directly out of uh, the software development uh, lifecycle gap analysis um, uh, questionnaire that we use and uh, leverage that uh, in, in the research survey. And uh, I'm, I'm going to show you at the end of this presentation, there's a, a link to a self-assessment uh, guide with respect to application security. Uh, now, again, this is just referencing the research uh, that we did in the state of application security maturity research, which is referenced at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but we essentially defined five levels of maturity. Uh, from uh, initial uh, all the way through to optimized. Uh, and, and you can read the report. Uh, if you want a copy of the report, just uh, yeah, there's an email address at the end of this presentation that yeah, you can make the request of. But it also shows you a lot of the data that came out of that. <coughs> Excuse me. And keeping in mind that a mature software development lifecycle, uh, even though you can start at one phase or another, whether it's at requirements or test, Ultimately, you do need to weave security throughout each of those phases. And mature organizations do this at each phase, but again, it's contextual to your organization, and some prefer to start at the back end of the software development life cycle. Others prefer to start at the front end. We usually recommend starting at the front end because it can be a good forcing function, uh, but you know your organization better than we do. And this diagram here, uh, this is one of my favorite diagrams uh, not because it's uh, it's the coolest looking or it's the sexiest, but it's because I created this diagram in 2004, 12 years ago, 
and it's still perfectly relevant. <laughs> and the, the one thing that you can really just take away from that diagram, this pyramid, is that security is just another aspect of software quality, just like functionality and performance and reliability. And if you treat security vulnerabilities like you do other software defects, oops, uh, and triage them accordingly, uh, it will start to sensitize your software development team to owning security as part of their quality initiatives. So some key components here. Uh, making sure that what you ask your software development teams do, to do are mapped to the compliance mandates and help them understand it. Uh, we have found that most software development teams generally want to write good quality code. Um, and once they understand what the implications are for them not writing code, uh, then they, they get on board with it much more quickly. So uh, you know, communicate to them. Uh, here's a quick case study uh, by Microsoft. And uh, what they did is, you know, they, they took two independent teams and put them through uh, Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle training. Um, and this is what they found. Uh, on the Windows team, uh, and this is between XP and Vista, uh, they were able to reduce vulnerabilities by 45%. And then on the SQL Server team, they were able to reduce the number of uh, severe vulnerabilities from 34 to 3, which is a massive uh, improvement. And Microsoft even then took it a step further. They calculated how much it cost them uh, to fix and patch uh, a single vulnerability. And then when you multiply by the reduction of vulnerabilities, they actually got to a, an ROI. But more importantly, it helped them understand that adopting security as part of their software development lifecycle actually improved the rate, increased the rate by which they could develop software because they weren't spending so much time finding and fixing a bunch of security defects. They were able to reduce the number of security vulnerabilities, reduce the number of bugs overall, and thus focus more on uh, development throughput and features. All right, so some best practices. Use the automated scanning products for the heavy lifting. They are terrific at finding common vulnerabilities, and uh, you can integrate them at various points, whether it's at the code level every time developers check in code, or it's uh, e even as the application is, is deployed in production and, and you're running uh, products like AppScan or, or AppSpider against them. Uh, but complement that with manual efforts. Uh, the attackers out in, in, the, uh, in the world are not just using automated scans. They're using automated scans to find low-hanging fruit, but then they're taking what they find and, and exploiting that with, uh, with some human uh, intuition and business logic and compound attacks. Uh, you should be doing the same thing. Uh, next is uh, vulnerability remediation. Uh, this one I really can't stress enough. Uh, it is so important to make sure that your development team has the information they need to be able to fix the vulnerabilities. And Many of the automated scanning products don't provide nearly enough content or context uh, for a developer to, uh, to fix vulnerabilities. But there is lots of good information available, even from organizations such as OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, uh, and MITRE's CWE, Common Weakness Enumeration. Uh, this is just a snapshot of uh, activities that, that we see. On the left-hand side is typically the development team. In the middle is usually the IT network team. On the right-hand side, this is a centralized security team where you've got the security team that might be running vulnerability scanning or doing security tests, tossing that information back to the developers on the left-hand side. In order for them to fix the problems or secure the source, as we say here, they need to have appropriate training and they need the secure coding standards. And then in the middle, is your potential mitigating controls, like your web application firewalls, your data loss prevention uh, technologies, and application whitelisting. Uh, these strategies, again, they're not mutually exclusive. Just because you have a web application firewall doesn't mean you don't need to train your developers on how to write secure code. Uh, and and um, similarly, uh, just because you're doing um, security testing uh, from a centralized security team doesn't necessarily mean your development team should be doing something similar. So. Uh, in conclusion, and then I'm going to get to the slide where uh, you can uh, email for requests of uh, you know, copies of the presentation, et cetera. Uh, application risk rating is an important step. Uh, so please, uh, we have an entire 60 minutes on just an application risk rating. Uh, if you're interested, there's a free webcast on that as well. 
educate your development teams so they can get the most out of any tools and technology that you are investing in because the people and process investments are going to get uh, the biggest return on investment. Uh, leveraging threat model, uh, threat modeling can help you substantially at every phase of your software development lifecycle uh, and where you can measure progress. Uh, this is the obligatory about security innovation slide which I will go through quite quickly and I will leave you with this which is a link to the self-assessment questionnaire for SDLC uh, maturity or, or application security maturity. Um, it's available right from the Security Innovation website. Uh, you will be plotted on the application security maturity curve, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side. And um, the, question is, uh, the questionnaire is completely anonymous. It takes about um, uh, maybe 15 minutes max. It's only about 20, 25 questions. And with that, um, I have a couple of questions that had come in. And um, Larry, I've got one for you, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, so the question is, why is it still fairly common for CISOs to report to CIOs? I've found this to be detrimental to my ability to get security initiatives approved. Do you have any thoughts on that, Larry? Great question. And it's a big problem because um, a lot of folks basically are trying to do the best they can from a security perspective and they basically are reporting to an individual who's basically incentivized uh, to basically look at different things that may not prioritize security in the same way that a CISO would. So we basically are seeing a trend where folks who are CISOs are being moved out of the IT organization and into more of an enterprise risk organization. This is especially true in the financial services and banking industry, but we're starting to see that model take hold in other industries as well. So my answer is hang in there. Things are going to get better because I think that is a leading trend and more of the better, you know, the, the companies that have best practices are looking at that, you know, the, should the CISO report to a CIO or outside. And also we're seeing the CISO, the CISO moving up. So it's a peer, not a subordinate to the CIO, and that's important as well. Terrific. Thank you, Larry. Um, so uh, time for, for one more question, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring this to a close since we're right at the top of the hour here. Um, so a uh, question uh, for, uh, I'll, I'll field this one. Um, <clears throat> this one says, security testing is done by our group, but we are not responsible for software development. What one or two things can we have our developers start doing to make sure our enterprise applications have fewer vulnerabilities? Uh, this is a very, very common scenario. In fact, I'm going to just go uh, back to a couple of slides um, right here. Oops, right here. Uh, so this question came from the group on the right-hand side. They're doing the testing, and they're asking, you know, the, for the group on the left-hand side, what can we do to help them, the development team, uh, code fewer security vulnerabilities? Uh, the one thing that I would suggest is get them some training, if at all possible. It doesn't have to be online computer-based training. There's plenty of free resources out there. Point them to the OWASP site, which is a rich repository of, of secure coding information. They have uh, cheat sheets on uh, a whole bunch of different security vulnerabilities. Um, and potentially send one or two of your development leads to one of the security conferences. You know, have them experience firsthand, have them see firsthand how uh, the industry is uh, is attacking software applications and some of the solutions that they can adopt. Uh, but more more than anything, help get them aware. Because until the development team is aware of the problems, they'll never change their behavior. So uh, my first recommendation is definitely training. Um, and I just want to make sure that uh, I'm clear that training doesn't have to be sort of formal classroom training or online computer-based training. Uh, it's just the first step toward, toward awareness and building that awareness. Uh, even just point them to free webcasts like this one, to be honest with you. Uh, I, you know, we've been talking here for, you know, for 60 minutes, uh, and there hasn't been a single you know, sales pitch or anything uh, on this, this webcast. That's because we're trying to do this uh, as much as a public service um, as, as we are anything else. So point your developers to these types of resources, uh, and I think they'll help. All right. Uh, with that, I think we'll bring the webinar to a close. Dr. Poneman, thank you so much for being generous with your time uh, and, as always, uh, being insightful with your research. 
Thank you so much. A great pleasure co-presenting with you again. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Uh, and I'll just leave this up on, on the screen um, for folks that want a copy of the presentation uh, or if you want a copy of any of the research that we mentioned here, uh, whether it's the Panaman Institute's uh, Rise of the Nation State Attack, the Application Security Maturity Analysis, or the, uh, the gap analysis that we did you know, between uh, management and practitioners, just feel free to, to email marketing at securityinnovation.com and we'll get you uh, what it is that you request. Thank you very much for spending your time with us uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are, and uh, safe coding to you all.